30% of the Netherlands has some kind of um, limited use based on infrastructure and the, and the laws surrounding in infrastructure. And what we said in this hypothetical project was, wouldn't it be interesting to look at infrastructure and ecology um, and look at the negative aspects of infrastructure, which are noise, pollution, gases, light, etc., emissions, um, look at those as inputs into some kind of infrastructural ecology, find ways of reorganizing them, just using infrastructural techniques like grid, bridges, aqueducts, etc. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't have time to lunch. For lunch, that was to be uh, thanks, uh, Organize them through infrastructural systems. Um, find ways using a state-of-the-art technology to select certain aspects of uh, the, these, these inputs, like um, certain gases, we call them gas selectors or noise selectors or whatever. If you can purify them, or if, if you can get them in a pure form, you can do something with them. Um, we combine them with production landscapes, with processes and with program that's all infrastructural related. It was a very cyclic way of thinking. And I'll just show one of the, the projects um, which came out of it. Uh, all infrastructure, all, all infra ecology start with obviously infrastructure. So you have your inputs. In this case, it's a, it's a highway and a waterway. Uh, as you know, our waterways are all polluted in the Netherlands. Um, and what we discovered uh, was that uh, NOx gas, if it comes into contact with um, pollen from um, um, pine trees, it produces uh, ozone. It's actually kind of summer smog, and ozone can be used to purify water. So what we did was we created a, a junction between a, a highway and a, a waterway, which is an aqueduct. Uh, we pumped up the dirty water into an ozone dome, um, and we used that to, 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 to purify the water system. So actually we're using the pollution from the highway to purify the waterway. Um, and at the same time we're creating a, a new kind of uh, cultural landscape which is a combination of a huge ozone dome and a forest, 150 meters in, in the air, and a, and a motel. To give an impression of what it would be like to drive through the uh, sparse farm, is what we called it, and a section of the building. And this seems quite far-fetched, but actually it was really well received in the Netherlands. It's included in the, the, the fifth spatial nota, so the, uh, the political layer in the Netherlands took this very seriously as a, as a project, not to realize it, but the, the thinking behind it. What you see here is a cross-section of the highway with, uh, this is a car, this is a cross-section of the waterway with um, kind of, with locks, um, and, it's, and a kind of a section through the building shows a kind of a funnel where the NOx gases move up into the ozone dome. The dirty water gets, um, how do we turn it into a spray, we evaporate that into the ozone dome, it collects in mist nets, it falls down into huge spar pools at the top and then it spirals down. These are the hotel rooms where you can park your car out, uh, right next to. It spirals down around the building and enters the, the waterway uh, on the other side in a clean form. So we calculated that we would need about 12 of these to purify the whole water system of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm sure the calculation is wrong, but <laughs> we were students, so we could, we could propose anything. An idea of what, what, the, what the building would look like and, and then a notion of these kind of this, this, this spar, spar environment. And of course we will never build this, but this project was uh, one of four proposals that we did that really changed my way of looking at architecture and urban design. And one of the key themes in, in our work is the, the idea of closing city cycles. So of course you all are familiar with the notion of a, the, the city as a well, metabolism, urban metabolism, and uh, the idea of optimizing urban systems. Um, uh, this is something we're exploring on different scales, how to optimize urban systems or architectural proposals uh, to close energy, water, material, waste, food uh, cycles. And that obviously uh, means that we need less inputs, we have a process optimization, and if you combine that with smart design, you improve the livability of your city. Um, of course, you also have a lot of um, saved costs, environmental benefits and social benefits, and if you connect that to smart processes, you could have a lot of social economic uh, benefits as well. One of the projects we developed for the Rotterdam Climate Initiative, which was actually initiated by Bill Clinton when he was here in Rotterdam, 
um, was REAP, the Rotterdam Energy Approach and Planning. Uh, this is a methodology we developed for the city um, to reduce the CO2 footprint. And REAP is a, a very simple um, concept, actually. It's based on the idea that if you look at uh, the total energy consumption in our cities, buildings are uh, responsible for roughly 40%, and two-thirds of that is for heating and cooling in a Dutch context. Um, so if you can come up with some kind of smart solutions, thinking in terms of closing cycles, uh, relating to optimizing the heat and the cold aspect, um, then you can have incredible uh, impact on your CO2 footprint. Uh, so we have analyzed all of the urban programs that we encounter in, in the Dutch context, from hospitals to supermarkets to schools, etc., and analyzed their um, energy profiles, let's say, heating, cooling, and, and electricity. And what you actually see is that certain programs have um, a, a permanent cooling demand and generate heat, so they have heat as a waste product, and vice versa. So it doesn't take a, a genius to think that you could kind of match this. Yeah? So for example, if you take a supermarket, there's a permanent cooling demand. You can use the heat generated from cooling to heat housing. Very simple. But in, in offices, it's the same. Offices when, in Holland, when it's 12 degrees outside, we're cooling our offices because we've got all the computers and lighting and etc. So we're cooling our offices when it's 12 degrees outside, and we're heating our homes. So if you could make some kind of a match, uh, that's quite an optimization. And in the case of existing apartments, for example, if you were to add a supermarket and a greenhouse, then with one square meter of a supermarket, you could heat seven square meters of housing. And with one, uh, with one square meter of a greenhouse, four square meters of housing. So a greenhouse is also a smart way of generating heat, not just uh, for a winter garden. And this is, of course, in a Dutch context. So, of course, in New York, it's completely different. But um, this way of thinking, looking at energy as a layer in spatial planning and trying to understand how can energy as a layer inform our architecture and, and inform our urban design led to a new step strategy. What is the <coughs> mechanism that makes that transfer happen? That's, uh, that's the question. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> it doesn't exist. No. Okay. It's not that difficult technically. Uh, on a building scale it's possible, but when you start getting to the district scale it becomes incredibly, incredibly complex, and I'll touch on that a, a bit later. It's, but that's really where the innovation needs to happen. So what we did was with REAP, we developed a very simple um, three-step strategy. Um, in Holland, we have a, in the 80s, there was a methodology for energy um, uh, efficiency called the Trias en Energetica, uh, the Trias Energy, which was a three-step st uh, strategy which was still fueled on the idea of using clean fossil. And actually, uh, in 2010, when we did this project, we said, well, we really should be beyond using clean fossil. fossil. So what we said was there's three steps. The first is to reduce the energy demand. That's really obvious. Uh, in new building, we do that by designing them really smartly, by climatically, and in existing buildings, it's obviously insulate, insulate, insulate. The second step is exchanging waste streams, so looking at how can you optimize your waste streams. And of course I use uh, heat and cold as, a, as an example here, but it's also about material, it's also about other, other, kind, other waste streams. And if you've done that very well, the third is to produce sustainable energy on a building scale. But what we see happening in the practice is that, especially at the second step, it's almost impossible to get a balance on a building scale. None of our buildings have the perfect balance of programs which um, are optimal for exchanging heat and cold. Uh, so we always look to the buildings around us. We always look to uh, a cluster, a cluster scale, and just basically see is there any building in the area which is um, offering a, a waste stream that we could use. And if it doesn't work on that scale, then we move to the district scale or to the city scale. So it's a, it's a layered strat strategy. And to give an idea of how that pans out on the building scale, uh, one of the, the, the most obvious uh, uh, ways of approaching uh, uh, reducing energy demand is through smart design. And oh, I don't have to explain this to you, but this is vernacular architecture. But in Holland, somehow we don't have a vernacular. Or we did have a vernacular, but we don't know what it is anymore. Uh, the Dutch have lost touch with the vernacular. Mm. And it, it may also have to, slightly to do with the, the climate, because it's a moderate climate. Um, uh, in, in, in extreme climates, uh, especially in, 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 in cultures where there's not much money, 
not much equity, uh, smart design by climatic design is, is really obvious. So one of the key things I'm interested in is um, in a, in a ch with climate change, if the temperature in Holland increases with a couple of degrees, <coughs> how appropriate could bioclimatic design principles be for our architectural interventions and our urban in interventions, and also the way in which we re re or rethink or retrofit our existing building stock? Because to be honest, we're not doing that much new building in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, most of our projects are really focusing on the existing stock, and that's where the biggest challenge lies. Um, and I'm sure I don't have to explain this to you, but obviously bioclimatic or passive design principles deal with climate, microclimate, orientation, uh, optimizing daylight, uh, natural ventilation, etc., etc. And in a Dutch context, it's impossible to, to achieve the ambitions that we have because in Holland, all our new buildings have to be energy neutral in 2020. That's a European directive. Uh, and all existing buildings have to be energy neutral by 2050. And that's a huge challenge. That's a really huge challenge. And our, we're, we're gearing up to that, but we're not ready for it. But in a Dutch context, we always have to combine the passive principles, obviously, with, with, with active uh, principles. And one of my fascinations is actually, if you take bioclimatic design principles as a, as a point of departure for design, um, uh, that means you're looking at climate and comfort as parameters or as instruments for design. What architectonic language or form uh, would derive, could derive, and in how far can that be culturally responsive and climatically responsive. And um, obviously you're all f familiar with the, the, all the theories in the 70s, uh, <coughs> Frampton's critical regionalism, etc., etc. But uh, what, what we see ha happening in the Netherlands in the 90s is that um, because of the, the amount of money that we had, the affluence, uh, it was all about concepts. So all of our buildings look the same. It's all about glass, it's all about status. Uh, we build the same glass tower in downtown Rotterdam as we build in Dubai, as we build in Tokyo, and uh, as long as it's taller than the one preceding it. Uh, and then what we do is we get a really good engineering company like uh, Arab to sort out the climate and make a, a 21 degree cocoon. Uh, so we, we solve it technically, and as long as fossil fuel is cheap, that was no problem. But obviously that's changing, so our approach has to change as well. This is a biochemically designed um, office building in the Netherlands um, uh, where we looked at a, a building volume of roughly 20,000 square meters. We introduced an atrium and we very simply uh, parametrically looked at a couple of things. We looked at daylight penetration, we looked at uh, the relationship to outside to views um, and basically it was very much about articulating a facade, creating a, a low energy building um, with maximum uh, relationships to outside and daylight. And obviously working very closely with building simulation uh, companies, uh, you can optimize that. And what we tried to do was come up with a, a facade that was a, a logical translation of these comfort and uh, experiential parameters. And that led to a building which uh, has uh, three very different facades, uh, east, west and, and north roughly. And what you see happening is in the facade, as you get an articulation, for example, a facade which steps back, the vertical louvers, the, the size between or the spacing between the louvers changes. And what I try to explain to students is that this is, of course, it's an aesthetic decision, uh, but it's also based on comfort and climate parameters. So there's also some kind of meaning behind it. And it's not just because I like the vertical pattern on the facade. And it's quite hard to somehow get that be between the ears. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Does this, does this building exist? Was it constructed? No, unfortunately, we won a we won the competition, mm -hmm. uh, but um, that was just before the crisis, and uh, they decided to renovate their existing building instead of building a new building. When you did the, the calculations for you know the, the climate control based on the architecture, did you take into account building materials and how you know different types of building materials might play into yeah, yeah, sure. We, we didn't get that deep into it because it was a competition, but we worked with, a, with an, ex, an expert looking at, um, well, obviously thermal mass, looking at passive cooling, using an atrium, uh, night cooling, um, as many passive principles as possible. And um, obviously the, the light and reflective uh, materials uh, incre increase the daylight penetration, which is interesting because if you, we also did the interior design and 
that was really interesting to see how climate and um, reflection could impact on the choice of materials. Uh, so also the ceiling materials, there was uh, reflective ceilings from the edges moving into a more neutral ceiling. And um, to me, that's really an, en an enrichment of um, the relationship between comfort, climate, and architecture and interior.